1970s were a period of growth for occupational therapy, a time when the profession sought to distinguish itself from medicine as an independent practice. Throughout the decade, OT saw an expansion in practice settings, educational programs, licensure requirements, theories and models of practice, and advocacy in federal legislation. The AOTA worked to promote occupational therapy as depicted in the following video clip. A man has a stroke and one side of his body is paralyzed. What's his name? An intelligent child fails in school because neurological dysfunction interferes with his ability to interpret correctly what he sees and hears. No, we're going to do something new. We get another piece of paper and just do a drawing on it. Anything at all you want to draw. Someone finds he is unable to cope with the stresses and demands of his family or job. Take another sheet and draw a picture of yourself. Any way you want to portray yourself. Occupational therapists are helping each of these people. Show me how you twirl. Occupational okay, therapy sure, today sure. is a dynamic profession, expanding its skills and services to meet the ever-changing needs of the community. In hospitals, in private practice, in community health centers, occupational therapists are using a wide variety of professional skills, meeting a person at his level of functioning and helping him reach the highest level possible for him. Occupational therapists are agents for change, trying to make a difference in the daily lives of the people they help. You know, that's amazing because I remember when you couldn't even uh, approach them at all. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act was passed in 1975. This legislation required all federally funded schools to provide access to education as well as one free meal per day to students with mental and physical disabilities. Those who advocated for the Education for All Handicapped Children Act envisioned an interdisciplinary approach to meet the needs of these children and included occupational therapy as a needed service schools should provide students with disabilities. This allowed occupational therapists to begin working in schools. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act was in effect from 1975 to 1990 when the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA was passed. The IDEA is still in effect today. The 1970s also saw an expansion of education offerings and standards for students pursuing this career path. The number of accredited occupational therapy programs increased from 36 to 53. Essentials of an Acceptable Education Program for the Occupational Therapist, a manual for accreditation, was revised in 1973, and the certification exam was revised to focus more on problem solving and application of knowledge. Finally, in 1975, a resolution was passed to require all occupational therapy assistants to take a certification exam in order to practice. In 1974, the AOTA officially came out in support of state licensure practice requirements, and Florida and New York became the first states to pass OT licensure laws. By 1979, 13 states and two districts, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, were licensed. In the 1970s, conflict still existed between two schools of thought in OT practice, humanistic moral treatment versus the scientific school. These conflicts generally revolved around reductionism versus holism, treating whole clients versus just treating their disability. In 1972, Dr. Jean Ayers published the Southern California Sensory Integration Test. This practice model focuses on helping children integrate sensations in order to adapt behaviors to their environments. The publication of the Sensory Integration Model was a milestone in OT practice and is still widely in use today. Mental health was a growing field in OT in the 70s, but there were challenges. 
the AOTA determined that the biggest one was a simple lack of foundational practice in mental health OT. Another was a lack of educational preparation. Students graduated with enough knowledge to practice in the field, but not enough to advance the profession forward in mental health care. Dr. Leela Lawrence was the first woman of color to be awarded the Eleanor Clark Slagle Lectureship, during which she presented on a theory of OT that focused on the neurophysiological, psychosocial, physical, and psychodynamic factors that influence development. Dr. Lawrence also advocated for doctoral level education and for the use of qualitative and quantitative research in OT. An article entitled Computers and Occupational Therapy was published in 1975. This was the first article to address the use of computers in OT and to explore the opportunities to use technology. The AOTA moved its headquarters from New York City to the Washington, D.C. area in 1972 in order to be able to interact with Congress more easily. In 1978, it also established the American Occupational Therapy Political Action Committee, a voluntary nonprofit arm with the purpose of lobbying Congress and supporting legislation to advocate for the profession. The AOTA also established several new special interest sections during the decade, including developmental disabilities, gerontology, mental health, physical disabilities, and sensory integration. Finally, during the 1970s, the American Occupational Therapy Foundation began to work toward increasing public knowledge and understanding of occupational therapy. We hope you've enjoyed this crash course on occupational therapy in the 1970s to 80s. Thanks for watching.